Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Louis B. and Louise Hirschfield Coleman, Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, and contributions to participating stations. Coming up on this Best of 2015 edition of SciTech Central. Can storytelling impact scientific understanding? One theoretical physicist thinks it's essential. And that changes the way you think about science when it kind of makes your heart beat fast or it makes those little hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And underwater researchers make an unexpected discovery. When we got on the bottom, we were a little confused as to whether we were on the ridge or off the ridge. And then we came across two anchors with chains connected to them and we were intrigued. Exploring the frontiers of science. Probing cutting edge technologies. Seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. Even as technology advances at breakneck speed and scientists conduct detailed explorations of extraterrestrial bodies, only about 5% of the ocean floor has been mapped. Project Baseline, a Florida research organization, is helping change that. Exploring the oceans has always been a difficult, dangerous, and expensive proposition. Divers can only explore within a shallow depth and for a short time. Submersibles are expensive and provide only a limited view of their surroundings. But a company in Vero Beach is making new generation subs that greatly expand the ability of researchers to explore the oceans. I think the first thing most people notice when they see the Triton is the acrylic sphere. It has to be optically perfect, dimensionally perfect. If it wasn't perfectly round, it wouldn't be as strong as it needs to be. A great view isn't the only advantage. Researchers can also dive safely for extended periods. We carry 96 hours of reserve life support in addition to our 10 or 12 hours of normal mission time. Because Triton subs are safe and relatively inexpensive, many research groups can utilize them. One such group is Project Baseline out of High Springs, Florida. Project Baseline is really so simple that it's almost too simple. It's about empowering anyone interested in the water to go take a photograph and write a general observational report about what they see about their favorite spot in this world that's water related. During a recent dive off the coast of Lake Worth, Project Baseline teamed up with Nova Southeastern University to explore a large ridge that had been recently discovered. It's a, a very unique opportunity to be able to see something remotely and have questions, all kinds of questions about what's there, and then being able to go visit them is pretty amazing. That's so the ridge, you think, runs west. all the way to mm -hmm. through on, it's the same ridge? Yes. Looks okay. like it. Yes. They're both on the We're really not actually looking for point one yeah. or point two. That's We're right. We're really looking for the ridge. That's right. We haven't been able to explore this ridge because of the depth. It's about 250 feet. It's outside of normal diving limits. And so today we'd like to utilize the submarines to go down and get a good look at what's living down there. My role in this is to take scientists and different researchers from around the globe down into the environment that they normally study purely from a lab or from a remotely operated vehicle. By placing them into an HOV, a submersible, we're able to get them immersed in three dimensions. In our modern subs, we're situated inside of an acrylic sphere that's optically matched to seawater. It has air conditioning and communications. There's a surface tracking device. And what I'm doing is taking their locations, tracking it with this boat, and then we've got our chart of the areas we're having them go to. They can't get GPS on the ocean floor, so we're their GPS up on the surface. When we got on the bottom, we were a little confused as to whether we were on the ridge or off the ridge because it wasn't as prominent as we'd hoped. It turns out that we did hit the mark, so we just kind of traversed the area for a while, and then we came across two anchors with chains connected to them, and we were intrigued. One of the biggest differences between going into submersible and scuba diving is the fact that you really get a time to appreciate the environment you're in. There's a little bit less concern as an observer about your buddy and your life support. You really just get to sit there and explore. We weren't looking for a wreck. 
We were looking for coral and hard bottom structure that naturally provide habitat, and we've unfortunately, in the course of three hours, found none. It was quite a neat sight to be on. There was a lot of fish. We saw a large sunfish called a mola mola, which is a very special sight to see, especially in 200 feet of water. Unfortunately, we saw a lot of lionfish, which are invasive species, and they had that wreck pretty well covered. This giant shipwreck was providing this artificial habitat that those fish would have normally sought out natural habitat. But unfortunately, the hard bottom structure, the natural habitat's gone. And we've all got to get a handle on why that's occurred, is that's where the fish are supposed to be living. By accumulating data through many similar outings, Project Baseline expects to establish a universal point of reference for the quality of the aquatic environment. The new students that we have coming in at the moment, their baseline is different. And so I think it's important for Project Baseline to capture that. The sooner we create a stable baseline, pictorially and scientifically, then we're able to monitor at a very effective level where everybody in the community, whether they have a scientific college degree or they're a simple person observing something on TV, they'll get it. And the visual nature of Project Baseline's evidence is what makes it so powerful. The people that don't dive and don't experience the water like we do need to understand the impact of what's going on from what we do in our everyday life, how it's affecting two-thirds of the planet. These great universities and researchers all over the world have volumes of data that explain exactly what's going on, but no one listens and no one reads to the degree that is necessary to cause an emotional response in the general public. An image causes a visceral reaction. My name's Doug Roadhamel and I'm an artist. I work at a coffee shop and you know, one of my jobs there is to take out all the trash and it's kind of disheartening because all of this is going to go somewhere so it's nice to be able to pull some of that out and make it into something. Here we have submarines that are made of cardboard and parts and pieces, slurpy straws and toilet paper tubes. I kind of build it with the intent that it's a piece of artwork, but I always tell everyone to look closer and see what parts you might recognize. And when they start doing that, it's, oh, it's, that's a bottle cap. Maybe I can make something like that when I go home. On the second floor, I have a large 16-foot mobile made completely out of cardboard and surplus parts. On the first floor, I have jellyfish hanging from the ceiling that are made from Coke bottles and salad containers and plastic parts and pieces. It kind of shows people that things aren't always what they seem they are, and that's how problems get solved, just by looking at things in a different perspective rather than always what they are. I kind of hope that gets translated into my work. Brian Green is a theoretical physicist who's made important contributions to string theory. He's also a best-selling author. At a recent event in Orlando, he presented a reimagined Greek myth bringing science to his audience as an emotional, even visceral experience. UCF Celebrates the Arts is a week-long festival that includes many art forms. Part of its mission is exploring ways to melt science and art. For Brian Green, the event presented an important opportunity. UCF has a really wonderful program that is a way for the community to come together where it's not those that like art go to the opera or to the symphony. Those that like science go to the lecture. Let's come together and get people to engage with the scientific ideas through the art. Then they can have an emotional experience of science and that changes the way you think about science when it kind of makes your heart beat fast or you know makes those little hairs on the back of your neck stand up when it gives you that kind of catch in your throat that's a different way of engaging with science green believes that storytelling is key to sharing complex scientific principles with the general audience the most powerful strategy that I've found for communicating abstract ideas is to not only 
translate them from the mathematics, which very few of us speak, into ordinary language that can be accessible. But if you can take those ideas and weave them into a story, weave them into a narrative, the human brain has got to engage with story differently than anything else. I'll be on stage talking about ideas and I feel a certain engagement, but then if I shift into story mode, I feel as though the audience collectively leans a few degrees forward because the brain, the mind, the spirit is moved by story. And if the science is woven into the story, it's almost a, a painless way for the science to have a way in. To reach more members of his audience, Green turned to a classic Greek story. How many people are familiar with the original myth? What does Icarus do? He flies too near the sun and he crashes into the sea. So the moral of the story is you don't do what daddy says and you die. <laughs> now look, I don't know about you, but that always bothered me from the very first time I encountered that story. And as I got older and became a scientist, it bothered me for a different reason because in order to make great breakthroughs in science, in order to push the envelope of understanding, you have got to go against what your elders tell you. You've, you've got to fearlessly go out into the unknown. That is what scientific exploration is all about. Green collaborated with several artists to turn his children's book, Icarus at the Edge of Time, into a multimedia performance that dramatizes Einstein's theory of relativity. Icarus heard the voice of the commander, his father, over the address system. All hands to stations. Race for emergency course diversion. We're navigating to avoid an unchartered black hole. A black hole? Cool! If you go to this piece and know nothing about the physics, you won't leave being able to do research on the general theory of relativity, but you will leave with a sense of what goes on near a black hole by virtue of just going for a ride in a story. I, I hope kids see this and leave with a renewed sense of how science is a wonderful story of adventure. Pulling away for the last time, Icarus let out a cry of victory. Ha <laughs> ha! That'll definitely be remembered! Brian Greene's main professional pursuit is the esoteric field of string theory. He's also passionate about inspiring others to explore the infinite marvels that surround us. I think the wonder of the universe is that there is such a wealth of distinct phenomenon that happen out there from formation of stars and galaxies to planets to all of the processes that are required for life. And the amazing thing is that underlying it all are some simple patterns that mathematics, physics, they can capture. And there's nothing to me that's more thrilling than to see a few patterns laid out in a few equations and to recognize that within that is all of the stuff that we see around us. If you can feel that, I think there's really nothing more thrilling than that. In 2006, NASA launched the New Horizons spacecraft to study Pluto, its moons, and the Kuiper Belt. We recently sat down with Dr. Alan Stern, the mission's principal investigator, to learn a little more about this historic undertaking. New Horizons is NASA's exploration mission to the Pluto system and the Kuiper Belt. It turns out that the understanding of the Kuiper Belt is important to understanding the formation of the solar system because the Kuiper Belt is kind of the solar system's attic. It's where all of the ancient objects, the building blocks of the planets, and this new class of small planets is located. And we didn't know about it until the 1990s. We used to think of the solar system as the four inner rocky planets and then the four giant planets. We thought the giant planets were the outer solar system. They're really the middle solar system. This is the whole third region. From the data sets that we'll collect with New Horizons, we're going to learn a great deal about the Pluto system and how it came to be. And that's going to help us connect the dots for how the planets form. 
we're learning that the Earth and the planets like the Earth are actually the oddballs, that there are a lot more small planets than there are big planets. But even these objects are not that small. If you were to drive around Pluto's equator and clock the distance, it's as far as from Manhattan to Moscow. The consensus today is that Pluto as a dwarf planet is a type of planet. Just like the Sun, if you look it up in a textbook, is called a dwarf star. Doesn't make it not a star. The orbiter Atlantis flew 33 missions, deployed 14 satellites, and traveled over 125 million miles. But she didn't lose her purpose when the shuttle program ended in 2011. Her new home is just a few miles from the spot where she was launched, and she continues to inspire new generations of space enthusiasts. Three, two, one. Ignition and liftoff, liftoff of Atlantis. A new orbiter joins the shuttle fleet and it has cleared the tower. The space shuttle is probably the most marvelous flying machine that man has ever built. Not only could it carry astronauts to and from space, but it could carry a, a very large amount of cargo as well. John Creighton flew three shuttle missions, but one holds a special place for him. Atlantis is near and dear to my heart because that was the vehicle that I flew the first time as the commander on the space shuttle. 135 missions. 2,000 tons, two and a half million moving parts. The orbiter vehicles, as they were officially known, were the largest, most expensive, and most complex spacecraft ever built. But like everything, they had a finite lifespan. When the shuttle program was going to conclude, NASA took a look at what to do with the remaining three orbiters from the program and made the decision that each would be displayed in museums throughout the country. On the 30th anniversary of the first shuttle flight, NASA announced which facilities would receive the orbiters. We were thrilled to find out that Space Shuttle Atlantis was going to be here at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Then, the real work began. We looked at the Space Shuttle exhibit as the cornerstone and wanted to do something dramatic and showcase the orbiter as no other place on the planet. This was a challenging challenging project when you look at trying to display an orbiter as if it's flying in space. We're trying to recreate that experience here on Earth. Construction on the new exhibit building began in January 2012. Meanwhile, Atlantis was being prepped for her new role. To fuel the space shuttle, you have liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, and residues from those fuels can be left in the engines. So a lot of time and a lot of care went into making sure that those chemicals removed so that we can provide a safe viewing environment for the guests. Next, Atlantis had to be transported to the visitor complex. We moved 123 light poles, 23 traffic signs, 56 traffic signals, it was a 10-mile journey in all, something that took nearly a day. We constructed the Atlantis building, but left the north wall open so that Atlantis could slide right in. How do you carefully lift this orbiter? You have one shot at that. You don't want anything to go awry because you've got a $2 billion artifact that can't be recreated. We had to install steel beams. 60 feet long, carefully lifted the shuttle, beginning at two-inch increments for several days. While that was happening, Atlantis was being shrink-wrapped to surround and protect her. Several months later, when we unwrapped Atlantis and needed to open the payload bay doors, we brought in a special brace that we put on the edges of the payload bay doors, carefully opened them, and then using six long cables of steel, we're able to secure the payload bay doors in an open position. For many of those visiting the exhibit, Atlantis is as inspiring in repose as she was in flight. I think it takes your breath away. Now from TV, all you see is this smooth white, what you think is this perfectly clean, unused vehicle, but it's, it's got so much more history to it. You see everything, you just think, whoa, that's amazing. A breathtaking experience, uh, magnificent, uh, outstanding. I never thought I would see a real spaceship up close, like standing right in front of it right there. I think we're so used to seeing things on television and it doesn't necessarily feel real, but when you come and see it in person, it's huge, it's impressive, and you really get a better feel of what it was like. The visitor center here has done an amazing job of displaying Atlantis. Far and away, you know, the best 
uh, the other orbiters that are you know, now on display at museums around the United States. The Space Shuttle Atlantis attraction has exceeded our expectations. Millions of people have seen this from around the world. Atlantis made history as a flying machine and now makes a unique museum piece. But her most important role may lie in the future. We need to get uh, more people interested in the technical areas. You see kids come around here and I have an opportunity to talk to them and they're, they're all excited about that. We need that kind of technical talent. Public has an opportunity to go around and learn not only about what we did with the space shuttle, but why we go into space and what's coming in the future. Our purpose here at Camp Kennedy Space Center is to inspire young children and just getting them excited that we are still have a very large presence up there in space. Start up successfully. My favorite part of the camp was probably some of the simulators that we did. We did one where it was called the gravity wall and you felt like you were weightless. It was really cool and unlike anything I'd ever done before. You're weightless. We have a slingshot to Mars activity where they take a raw egg astronaut and we launch it to see if they can build a capsule to support their astronaut. Giant leg survived! It was awesome. My egg actually survived. And I slingshot it with two stage fuel. It's they create a fun learning environment without them realizing that they're really learning a lot. I really see what it's like to work with a team. Parts of it were hard and parts of it were fun because of the contrasting ideas that we had. But then once we all came together, it was really fun. These are going to be our future rocket engineers, our rocket scientists, our, our astronauts, and it's a good place to start right here at Camp KSC. Drones are becoming ubiquitous, but they're often viewed by the public with fear and skepticism. A passionate group of Central Florida racers are integrating miniature technology with these small flying machines to create a new sport. And they want to share the fun. MultiGP is a grassroots racing league. Whenever you are looking to race FPV, race multi-rotors, or drones, like a lot of people like to call them, you need a place to do it. And so that's what the grassroots effort of multi-GP is focused on. It's our goal to find a place in every city, a field in every city, and put coaches and train people in those fields so that way we can have a real sport occurring all over. As of October 2015, Multi-GP has 140 local chapters around the world and over 3,000 registered pilots. This sport is growing. We started about three months ago in our group with about five or six guys. It was just a couple of friends that wanted to start the, you know, the group. Now we have almost 150 members, and every day there's always somebody new getting on it. At a recent event in Orlando, pilots competed to improve their national rankings. So as a pilot, you come to their official monthly race if you want to be ranked on their leaderboard to determine how good of a pilot you are. By participating, you gain points that go to the overall score that you would have if you participate in each of these events. The Multi-GP website lists upcoming races. It also provides pilots key information they need to compete. They register, and it gives them a frequency. And that frequency is what they use to fly. And then I tally up the points, and at the end of the six months, it also gives them a total of points for the championships. Like all competitors, multi-GP pilots are constantly searching for ways to gain an edge. So part of racing is studying the track and looking at your machine and saying, okay, how can I tune this machine for my next race? What, do, what will I need, speed? Will I need agility? That stuff you have to take into consideration when you're gonna go fly. And it's part of the tuning process. If you're, let's say today you're racing in a track that's a really long track with minimal turns, you can use really big motors and you'll be able to have a lot of speed. The track was really interesting. They actually did an upper raised gate where you had the opportunity to shoot a small hole and save some time, so that was really exciting. It's a race car, so you always have to make the fine adjustments to be a little bit faster than the other guy, which would be changing the propeller, changing the motor, or tilting your camera a little higher as you get better. I have it written 
The people who are in this sport right now, this is the early adopters. They're, they're technology people, they are computer people, they're smart people. It's a bunch of nerds at a park, really. That's how I like to refer to it, but it's a great culture of people who create. A small video camera on the drone literally gives pilots a bird's eye view. While essential to the sport, remotely controlling a flying vehicle this way is definitely a learned skill. Racing a multi-rotor is similar to real racing in that you have a course, you're trying to follow that course, and you're trying to go as fast as you possibly can. But what's different is it starts off a little disorienting for most people. This is a set of FPV goggles. It provides a real-time video feed for, to the camera that's on board. So this is our link to being in control. Most of the time you start off flying around, you trying to get a feel, how high am I? Am I going up? Am I going down? The first time I took off, your equilibrium is so confused. You're just in a different plane. You're turning and banking and your body's sitting still. It's really awkward. It takes a while to get used to it. You have to operate the throttle, which makes you go up and down. The ailerons, which makes you bank left and right. The pitch, which makes you makes your nose go up or down and the rudder which rotates the quad around the horizontal axis. All those four controls have to be used at the same time. And it takes a lot of patience, a lot of practice to be able to master those four controls. And there is no substitute for a stick time. The more you fly, the better you're gonna get. It's not always about how fast you are, it's how good you fly through the track. As with any racing sport, the thrill of speed is a big attraction. But multi-GP boasts a huge advantage over others. As you get older, you get wiser, you start to mitigate risk. You're less likely to put yourself at harm. Here, you're able to race aggressively, head to head, in a really exciting format without the risk of hurting yourself. It's all the fun of competing and racing without any of the physical risk. I used to ride sport bikes. I had a couple bad accidents on it, and I get the same kind of adrenaline rush racing this, and I get to come home in one piece, so mission accomplished. Thank you for watching the best of 2015 edition of SciTech Central. Join us next week for more stories from the frontiers of science and technology. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Louis B. and Louise Hirschfield Coleman, Sue and Edgar Wackenheim III, and contributions to participating stations. Music